So, I was told we were going to have a lot of public, and I made a really general, like, kind of biochar 101 presentation, so this may bore the crap out of you. Um, I'm going to just blow through the presentation. Feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions, and we can make this just sort of a template for discussion. Um, and we can go as deep into any of the parts you guys want, since I know that you guys all have more experience with biochar than uh, this presentation was actually made for. Um, so, me, I am, uh, I've been in the biochar space for a little bit of three years, um, I'm EVP of biochar engineering. Basically means I'm doing PR, HR, IR, marketing, fundraising, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, and then I also set up and run the Carbon Worms biochar operation, which is designed to identify and remove market barriers to scaling biochar to its gigaton sequestration potential. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, so if you want to ask any questions about what the carbon worm is doing, what biochar engineering is doing, I'm totally, I'm happy to be of service, however it's useful to you guys. So as I'm sure you all know, this is biochar, basic dissection of the word, biological charcoal. Uh, to make from smoldering biomass in an oxygen-deprived environment. I find that when I'm talking to people in the outside world, that smoldering is something that makes sense to them. If you talk them about pyrolysis or thermochemical distillation, or they're going to have the amigo, my eyes glaze over effect. Smoldering is something that people get. Where does it come from? I'm sure you all know, Terra Preta, the uh, dark earth in the Amazon basin. Was it, were any of you guys at the Brazil conference in, in, uh, in Brazil? At Brazil Conference 1? Two, three, awesome. Lucky people, I don't know there. Um, so they say it was up to 7,000 years ago and included compost, fish bones, pottery shards, and charcoal. As I'm sure some of you guys know, there are people that are working on trying to replicate Terra Preta, but right now it's, it's largely um, speculative in terms of what actually made it so special. And likely what made it so special is time. Um, I say as much as 10% of Amazonia is covered in Sarpreza. So biochar is actually being dubbed the secret of El Dorado. Um, here's a little anthropological history. So when conquistador Francisco de Orellana went down into the Amazonian basin in 1542 and did his exploratory conquesting kind of thing, he um, came back and Describes to the king and queen of Spain seeing these you know, huge 100,000 person towns and agriculturally engineered landscapes and um, big causeways between the towns. And about 40 years later, explorers went back and found just about zilch. And we found out later that's because everybody was wiped out by smallpox. Um, but pretty much everybody assumed that he was either just lying to impress the king and queen or maybe they found some South American plant and had a little fun time with it. Um, even modern anthropologists dismissed it because Amazonian soils are so notoriously infertile that there's no way that they could have sustained that level of population, or so they thought. Um, and then in uh, the early 2000s, a Duke University researcher went down and started to make that anthropological connection um, between everywhere that the conquistador claimed seeing these, these cities, he also found this charcoal in the soil. And bada bing, it started to be of the, the Secret of El Dorado, and there's a fantastic documentary done by B, BBC on that. The uh, link is down there if you want to write down all the little hash marks and everything. Um, it, it's, it, it's also sort of poetic in a way because the, the Amazonians were able to make their environment able to sustain them uh, when they had sort of overgrown their britches through the use of biochar. And uh, there's the potential that humanity could do the same by restoring the carbon to the soils today and uh, hopefully making our environment habitable to us um, when we're overgrowing our pitches as well. Why do we need new technology? This is the way it was traditionally made. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen and are starting to understand a lot of, of what goes into making this a more clean and sustainable process. Um, need I say more? Well, yes, I am going to just because that's what I do. Um, Black carbon, so, so what you saw in, in the, the smoke in the pictures before is some part steam and a lot of black carbon. Black carbon is considered a short-lived forcer, short-lived climate forcer. Um, so there are 
car carbon dioxide has, you know, let's just say it has a warming level of about this. There are three short-lived forces <coughs> which have a warming effect of about half as much as, as carbon dioxide. So it's significant. Carbon dioxide is not the only warmer. Uh, the short-lived forces are black carbon, methane, and tropospheric ozone. Black carbon accounts for about half of the warming effect of the other uh, short-lived forces, SLS. And black carbon itself has a triplicate warming effect. So it absorbs heat in the atmosphere when the, the particles go into the atmosphere. It lands on snow and ice in the Arctic and melts it. And then what was snow and ice and was reflecting water, or reflecting heat, is now water and is absorbing heat. So it's a triple whammy in terms of, of its warming effect. And it has a very short half-life in the atmosphere. So the short-lived forces are named short-lived forces because Carbon has a half-life of about 100 years in the atmosphere, so we're still experiencing the warming effect of our carbon emissions from the Industrial Revolution, uh, whereas the short-lived forces have a, a half-life on the order of months to a few years. So if we were to stop the short-lived short forcer, forcer emissions, black carbon in this case, um, we would notice a, an immediate cooling effect, as opposed to carbon dioxide, where we're going to, you know, any of the efforts that we make now, they're just going to be feeling it 100 years down the road, which is good for us to start to think in longer time scales. Oh, my children's children's children. It's, I don't know. I tend to not think past lunch, but um, it's good to, good to think forward. Um, but still, we, we obviously need to, uh, to, to move faster than that. Agricultural burning and traditional charcoal making are some of the main sources of black carbon. Um, so the use of biochar, as opposed to those traditional methods, uh, can, can be a, an answer to some quick climate cooling. Um, and in addition, agricultural burning is generally done in the springtime when the Arctic ice is already starting to melt a little bit, so it's, it's about the worst time of year to do it in terms of the, the, uh, the ice is already turning to snow, or turning to water, so it's much easier to warm it. Any questions there? So how is biochar made now? There's this thing called pyrolysis or gasification. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Um, take something like that, put it into something like that, and uh, or one of the one of the things that you guys have been making here, and you get something like that. Uh, this is uh, one of the biochar engineering systems. And for the general public, why should I care? Because biochar has value and, and applications both in climate change, soil fertility, and energy, which represent three of the most critical problems that we're facing today. Um, and there's some, some, amazing, um, some amazing soil facts in a, a book called Slow Money, which is also um, talking about moving towards investing as if food, farms, and fertility actually matter. Um, and if you want to really scare yourself about where soil is going today, read that book and just see how the idea of peak oil, um, soon we're going to have the idea of peak soil, and uh, getting, getting carbon back into the soil and improving our soil tilth is going to be critical coming up. So talking a little bit about biochar's role in climate change, um, my colleague and the president of biochar engineering will be here this afternoon, and he'll be going much more in depth into biochar's gigaton sequestration potential, etc. Um, so I'll just gloss over it, and then Jim will get more into it for you. It's time to get positive about negative thinking. I'm sure you guys have all seen this wonderful graphic. If I get the money, I'm going to replace it. <laughs> have somebody replace it so it can be a little more clear. But basically, business as usual, the uh, biomass decomposes and goes back. The carbon goes back in the atmosphere within a few months to a few years, depending on the type of biomass, or it's burned and goes back in the atmosphere immediately. Um, and in the case of biochar, you've got carbon stable in the soil for centuries to millennia. And I'm sure that you guys all know that that is going to depend greatly, very greatly, depending on the type of, of biomass and the type of process and your fixed versus labile carbon content of the biochar and the weathering conditions of the soil, etc. So you can see that making a carbon protocol around that is, is a fairly complex equation. Um, and I'm also working on an effort around that, if you guys want to know more about that. Happy to, happy to spin off on that for a while. Um, it was one of the more simple um, graphics that I've seen done by uh, Lawrence Rodemacher of, of uh, Biochar Fund, but just showing that the comparison of biochar between other 
other energy systems. So energy from fossil fuels, obviously you've got carbon coming out of the ground and going back into the air. You've got CCS, you've got some of it going back in the air and a portion of it going back into the ground. Serious reservations about whether or not this is going to work, particularly economically. Um, but then there's also a, a technical capacity that there just may not be enough geological formations to handle the amount of carbon that we need. But we need all solutions fast. So definitely move forward with this. You had millions of dollars in the piece. Um, Carbon neutral, we've got solar, wind, geothermal, tidal energy, um, algae, biofuels, and uh, carbon negative in this case, we're taking um, carbon out of the atmosphere, putting it into the ground, and actually in this case, we should still have a little small arrow here to illustrate that there still is about 50% emissions, but, you're, um, but you are having a net negative total. Go, go, get it, kick it on. Um, so, if you guys have not come across this study yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, this is a recent uh, article, study that came out in Nature Communications, um, led by Johannes Lehmann and Jim Emanet and a few others, uh, showing that biochar could sequester up to 12% of human GHG emissions. Uh, and this include, they, they illustrated avoided emissions from sustainable biochar productions versus biomass combustion over 100 years relative to business as usual. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a, is a remarkable study because there are some arguments against biochar saying, well, you know, if we, if we use, if we lock up some of the carbon and some of the energy value in the biochar and we're not um, using that biomass just for its energy value, then there's going to be some leakage uh, where you're going to have to, or somebody's going to have to burn fossil fuels in order to get the energy that they could have gotten from the biochar. Um, so the head scientist at EDF is a big proponent of this saying you know, biochar wouldn't work from a climate perspective because we need to be focusing on energy and getting ourselves off of, um, off of fossil fuel sources. Argument there is that we are moving towards a more and more renewable uh, economy for, for our energy value and so it's, it's hard to model what the, what the benefits of biochar are compared to biomass combustion, but this this report did uh, did that. Um, so they had three model scenarios. The sustainable biochar is represented by the solid lines, and biomass combustion is represented by dash lines. The top panel shows annual, bottom is cumulative, and uh, the diamonds indicate a transition period when biochar capacities at the top uh, 15 centimeters of soil fills up, and alternative disposal options are needed. Um, and once you start getting into the alternative disposal options, that's where it gets a bit more into the geoengineering side that a lot of biochar folks won't tend to talk about because we don't really want to be associated with geoengineering. But um, in the event that we get into a climate emergency situation and we're freaking out and need to get carbon out of the atmosphere, then biochar would be a, a good option to make tons of carbon and potentially drop it into the ocean, etc. It's important to note that this 12% number is the maximum sustainable technical potential, so that's assuming that all waste biomass is being appropriated to biochar, which is a pretty big assumption. So we're just talking theoretical potentials. Um, obviously there's a lot of competition for that biomass, and as people start to transition from the idea of there being a thing as waste and there not being such a thing as waste, but it actually has value, um, biochar is going to need to compete more and more within the uh, spectrum of of uh, waste streams. And just a little note on soil fertility. Soil parts biochar. I heart biochar too. Um, so biochar has been repeatedly documented to increase water retention, reduce nu decrease nutrient leaching, thereby reducing the need for fertilizer inputs. Increasing nutrient bioavailability, uh, largely a function of increasing microbial activity as well. Increases cation exchange capacity of the soil, and microbial activity there again, and uh, increases crop yield by 15 to 20 percent depending on original soil quality. 15 percent you're going to see in places like Iowa where the soil is already fantastic and you can only improve on perfect so much. If you've ever been to Iowa, I just was just there for my first time in, in June for the Biochar Conference. It is amazing. The soil is so black and beautiful. It was just like, it, it felt very rich to be around. It felt like a lush place. Um, and then the 200% you're going to see more in um, desertified areas. Or